I am welcome back. Give yourself a few seconds, settle in. you're here. Welcome back. Let's start our introduction to metabolism today. When we're discussing metabolism, it's, it's probably um, pretty common to hear the word metabolism and think about things like diet, think about things like weight gain or loss, Somehow, along the way, the diet industry has sort of taken ownership of this term, of metabolism, as if um, it means something about body shape or body size. And that's, that's really not the case. I'm talking about metabolism. Cool thing about your body is that over the course of your life, your cells are going to synthesize two or three or four or maybe five of you simply in the amount of protein. So this is 225 to 450 kilograms worth of protein over the course of your life. And that is only talking about protein. Hopefully you remember when we talked about biomolecules, that there are many other important biomolecules. So your body is made up of mostly water, maybe around 70-ish -ish percent water. And this is an ish, so these percentages are not going to add up. Then we have the next largest portion, maybe you could call it, is about 16%, and this is protein. So protein is pretty important. So that, that four, 425 or 225 to 450 kilograms that your body synthesizes of protein, that's pretty significant. But we also are made up of maybe 16-ish percent of lipids, fats. And I realize that the diet industry has taken this term and made it something dirty, but I hope you realize that Fats are critically important as we move through this, the semester. We'll emphasize that more and hopefully you'll realize that more. We got some minerals in there. Minerals important. Minerals have to make things function. And then a little tiny 1% over here is carbs. I, I don't think you can see that. That color is too... We've got about 1% carbs. And this is another thing that the sort of diet industry has made into a dirty word carbohydrates. Very, very important. When we get to the digestive system, we'll discuss that more. Metabolism is kind of the mystery or the magic of how you go from burger to muscle cells and or adipose. Adipose stores energy. It also sequesters toxins. It's an important part of your body or DNA. Okay. Many, many, many. These are just some examples. So how do we get from burger to all of these parts of our body? Well, the answer is the magic of metabolism. And what, meta what metabolism actually is, is all of the chemical reactions in your body. We talked about in our introductory lectures, all of these chemical reactions that occur. Metabolism is the summation of all of those chemical reactions that occur in your body. It can be simplified to let's let's speed up your metabolism for fat loss or 
things like that. The metabolism is wildly complicated. And we'll get to discuss some, some aspects of it. These chemical reactions can be divided into two broad categories. The first one is when we take, take components, sort of like smaller components is the way that we can think about this. So if these are glucose molecules, we take those glucose molecules in one of these broad categories and we take them all, arrange them into something more complex. And in this case, we've taken glucose at, via an anabolic reaction and what we've created is glucagon. So we took smaller pieces and we arranged them. We built something. We built glucagon. And this is an anabolic reaction. In an anabolic reaction, you take pieces and you build, you build something with all of those pieces. An anabolic reaction takes energy, lots of energy, and it uses far more energy than it releases. So all of those blue lines are this reaction going from these individual pieces of glucose to this large molecule of glucagon using lots and lots and lots of energy, releasing very little energy. And this is called an energonic reaction energonic is absorbs more energy than it releases and the way I remember this is this part right here and you'll see this repeatedly in biology you'll see this definitely repeatedly in physiology where that en means something's entering it's coming in so we have lots of energy entering but very little energy exiting so these anabolic, these building reactions are inorganic. They take up lots and lots of energy. And so one of the ways that we can describe these is they consume energy. So they're inorganic reactions. The other type of broad category of reaction is when we take something, like in this case, this is a protein, this is a peptide chain, and we break it up. We break it up into its individual smaller pieces. And when we do that, when we take something like a peptide chain, each of these little balls are representative of an amino acid and we break it up into its smaller pieces. We're breaking it down. This is a catabolic reaction. Breaking down is a catabolic reaction. And when we have a catabolic reaction, it's the opposite with regard to energy. Very little energy is taken in and a great deal of energy is given out of this reaction. Lots of energy comes out of a catabolic reaction. A catabolic reaction is an exergonic reaction and an exergonic reaction releases more energy than it absorbs. In your body, kind of the way to think about these two things. These are the two components of the metabolism. It's sort of like thinking about building blocks or Legos. So let's imagine that, that let's go back to your um, elementary days. Pardon, your elementary days or personally right now, um, building with Legos is one of my favorite things to do with my kids. Maybe this is something you really enjoy now. But let's imagine that you and your brother or your sister or your friend or whatever, you're building with blocks and they build a chair, but you wanna build a fish. So the chair is there and they're done building with the chair. They go off and they're interested in doing something else, but you wanna build a fish. So what you're gonna to have to do is you're gonna to have to take that chair apart, take those individual pieces and those individual pieces oops, sorry, oh. will allow you to then build something new. And that something new that you're going to build out of those individual pieces are, is the fish. So in this example that I apparently am going to animate 250,000 times, 
this example where you're taking over the chair, building your fish. So this is your catabolic breaking down. You break apart the chair. And then when you take those individual pieces that you pulled apart and built your fish, that's your anabolic. And these are constantly happening in your body. When you eat that burger or you eat that peach or you eat whatever it is, you take in those, that, those building blocks. But those building blocks are arranged in a certain structure, just like that chair was arranged in a certain structure. And so your body has to perform catabolic reactions to break it down and then takes those individual pieces and performs anabolic reactions to build the things that your body needs to function. All of this is mediated by something called activation energy, and you may have heard of this before. Activation energy, you can kind of think of it as like a ball. You're trying to roll that ball uphill to get it to go down the hill. And so this energy indicated here by this dotted line, it's not doing what I want it to do. So this energy, you're rolling the ball uphill, so this dotted line, what this dotted line right here indicates is the activation energy. How much energy does your body have to use to push that ball up to the top of the hill to get it to roll down the hill? This activation energy is the energy that it takes to initiate those metabolic reactions. It's how much energy does it take for those molecules to come in contact enough for that interaction to happen, for that catabolic or anabolic interaction to happen so that your body can break down your food or so that your body can build your protein and your carbohydrates and your lipids and your nucleic acids. That is your activation energy. So most of your body's reactions require a massive amount of activation energy. So a critical component in your body's metabolism is an enzyme. And what an enzyme does is it lowers activation energy. An enzyme Enzymes, all enzymes, are incredibly highly specific. The vast majority of enzymes are proteins. And hopefully you remember from earlier lectures or from just things you already knew that proteins are structures that are folded into three-dimensional structures. So perhaps you remember that in order to get a protein, we have to have our polypeptide chain and our polypeptide chain is a string of amino acids. And then this string of amino acids, this is our primary structure. And then remember that that string of amino acids and then is then folded into the secondary structure. That's an O, not an A. Secondary structure. And remember that we can do our alpha helix or our beta pleated sheets for our secondary structure. And then the tertiary structure is when we take those alpha helices and beta pleated sheets and we fold them again. And this at the tertiary structure is when we get our three-dimensional structure. And the three-dimensional structure is what determines the actual function of that protein. This is our three-dimensional structure. Then we can, we don't have to, but we can then go to a quaternary structure. And a quaternary structure is when we take multiple um, polypeptide chains, bind them together. Enzymes are by and large proteins. And they're proteins, of course, in the functional shape in this tertiary or in the quaternary structure. 
this 3D shape only exposes some of the areas, very specific areas. It folds all up into a really, really, really specific shape. And I've drawn this sort of like blobby thing over here as an enzyme, which is, which is cool. But enzymes, much like receptors, are, have that same key in the lock situation. So they are going to have a very specific site where they can only receive something that is exactly the correct shape. They're highly specific. Key in the lock. Very similar to receptors this way. So we have to have the correct key to fit in the lock with enzymes just as we did with receptors. Okay, things that affect the function of enzymes, how well they're doing their job or whether or not they're doing their job. Some enzymes need what's called cofactors, so they sort of need partners to do their job. And some really, really common cofactors are magnesium and calcium. If you work in a genetics lab, or if you spend any time in a genetics lab, I know many of you are involved in research. When you're doing a PCR, you have to add, you very frequently have to add magnesium. And the reason you have to add magnesium is because that, that super cool polymerase can't function without magnesium. Temperature. Temperature kind of affects everything. pH, as we talked about with homeostasis, what's the pH? That's going to affect which enzymes are functional and which, which enzymes are not. And then how concentrated is the substrate? And we're going to come back to this in just a moment. I am going to give an example of temperature differences because it's cool and it's fun. Cats. This isn't just true in cats, but cats is a really good example. If you uh, took genetics, you've probably already seen this. And you've seen this from a genetics perspective. But remember that genes encode proteins and the vast majority of enzymes are proteins. And so what we're seeing with this cat is up here on the ears, around the face, around the feet and the tail, the color is much, much, much darker. This cat is a much darker color. And the reason that this cat has a much darker color is that the core body temperature of anything, cat, human, cow, any endotherm, is much, much, much higher than are the extremities. So the extremities are cooler temperatures. So the ears, the face, the feet, the tail are cooler temperatures. And the enzymes that catalyze the reaction that allow for the deposition of this pigment that causes the dark color is only functional at cooler temperatures. So at the higher temperatures, the core body temperatures, this enzyme isn't functional. This is why we see this color pattern in cats. Okay, what about substrate concentration? On our y-axis, this is reaction rate. How fast are the reactions happening? On the x-axis is axis is substrate concentration. How much substrate? So how much of the thing that an enzyme is interacting with is present? That, that thing, that um, key, the key that goes in the lock. So remember the enzyme is a specific shape. The key has to be a specific shape. The substrate is that key. How much of that substrate do we have present? The line is the substrate concentration over the, and, and what the, it's showing substrate concentration and how reaction rate changes with substrate concentration. You can see that it goes up really fast. The more substrate we have, the faster our reaction rate. But just as with receptors, we reach saturation. There comes a point where there just aren't enough enzymes, no matter how much extra substrate you add to the reaction, if there aren't enough enzymes, it doesn't matter. 
this is saturation. This is very, very similar to receptors. So to a point, increasing sub substrate concentration vastly increases reaction rate until we get to saturation. Other things that influence what enzymes do, other modulators, are these, thing, these things called competitive inhibitors. So in this image, this blue thing is the substrate. In the metaphor that I've used, this is the key. This green thing is the enzyme. So that's like the lock. And there are these things right here, sort of this tannish color. These are inhibitors, competitive inhibitors. And what they do is they, what you can kind of think of them if you're using the key and the lock analogy, is that these inhibitors sort of gum up the lock, or they block the reactive site. So the enzyme and the substrate are the correct key and the correct lock, but you can have a competitive inhibitor that comes in and binds, and no matter how well that substrate fits, it doesn't matter because that competitive inhibitor is binding that enzyme reactive site. So what is that like? when when we are talking about so this this competitive inhibitor what is this like with regard to um receptors oh hang on What is a competitive inhibitor like? Very similar to something when we're talking about receptors. Okay, allosteric modulation. I don't know about you, but I feel like I, I hear that word and I've taught this many times. Allosteric modulation. That just sounds like a thing that I'm not gonna understand. And I promise it's not nearly as complicated as it sounds. In this case, what we're looking at is our green, our little green thing here. It's our enzyme. And our sort of whatever gross colored thing is our substrate. So sticking with the key and lock, substrate is the key, enzyme is the lock. And what you can see here is that the receptor site on the enzyme doesn't match the shape of the substrate. So this enzyme and substrate, this key and lock, they don't match. So what can happen is that an allosteric, something called an allosteric activator can come in. Hello, the little triangle. And it binds the enzyme. So it's not binding at the reactive site. It's binding somewhere else. Remember that this enzyme, I'm drawing it as these super, super simple images, but remember, it is this complex three-dimensional structure. So we have multiple binding sites. This allosteric activator, let's do it in red. is this kind of reddish triangle. And it comes and binds, and it comes and binds to a different binding site than where the substrate would bind. And in binding, what it does, is it does this really cool thing, is it causes the enzyme to change shape. It causes the enzyme to change shape. I don't know, guys, that's cool. I think that's really cool. It causes this binding site here this receptor site, this substrate site, whatever you want to call it right here, it causes it to change shape. And by the binding of this allosteric activator, this site changes shape. And now this key perfectly fits this lock. 
So you need you need this allosteric activator in combination with the substrate to cause the enzyme to do its thing. Okay. So if there's an activator, what what else is there? There's probably the opposite, right? In this case, we have an enzyme. The enzyme is represented here by purple. So this is our enzyme. This is our lock. And our key, our substrate is here. And they fit perfectly. Awesome. Well, maybe we don't want them to fit. Maybe the body needs to inhibit that reaction. In this case, enter an allosteric inhibitor. Inhibitor exactly what it sounds like. It inhibits the reaction. What happens is, here's the in green, the inhibitor, and it comes and it binds that enzyme, and by binding that enzyme, it changes the shape, similarly to the um, activator. But in this case, it changes the safe shape such that it doesn't fit that substrate anymore. So the substrate may come and try to bind, but it gets rejected because the allosteric inhibitor, by binding to a different place on this 3D structure of this enzyme, causes the place where the substrate would have bound to change shape. And so the enzyme changing shape prevents that substrate from being able to bind. So that's where we will we'll stop for now. And when we come back, we're gonna dig a little bit deeper into metabolism and specifically talking about ATP, adenosine triphosphate, often often just referred to as cellular energy, how that how that interacts with this whole process.